Okay, testing, testing. Okay, this is where we ended last time. <clears throat> um, just, just to pick up where we left off, the, the deal was made between sugar growers and, uh, i.e. Republicans and the Hawaiian, uh, the Hawaiian Republicans about creating Hawaiian homes. Um, we're missing one slide there, but basically it should look like this. Uh, Hawaiians, the Republicans, uh, the best lands, best government lands. In exchange for the worst government lands. Right? So these are the lands that they had already leased. They had leased the best lands to themselves. And then what's left over, Hawaiians get. That's the deal. So that's why earlier it said, when you look at the Hawaiian Republican Alliance, it's, it might be a form of coercion, not reciprocity. Because one side gets a much better deal out of the arrangement, this alliance. It's this side. Okay? So they have the deal, and then they have to sell it to Congress. So they're saying, Hawaiian Homes addresses the little guy who you're worried about. That's the point of the, those laws in the Organic Act. And once you have Hawaiian Homes, you don't need those laws anymore. Right? We covered that? Okay, and what's the problem with this logic? It doesn't cover everyone. It only covers Hawaiians more than 50%. It doesn't cover non-Hawaiians. It doesn't even cover Hawaiians who are less than 50%. Okay. Hawaiian homes, uh, if you look at the overall program, and this is not my opinion, the head of Hawaiian homes came here about 12 years ago, and he said, if you look at the history of the whole program, you have to conclude that it's been a failure, a massive failure. There's been some improvement in the last few years. Overall, it's been a failure, and it's because they had obstacles. For one thing, poor lands. It's the worst land. Uh, when I say worst land, I mean for agriculture. Because that was the point of the program. And people back then in 1920, they could see that, that this was being set up to fail. Uh, one of the people who was sort of on the side of Hawaiian said, if you want a program that's guaranteed to fail, well, you've just done it. Hawaiian homes. This is not so, so much of a problem now because agriculture is not the main use of Hawaiian homes. What is residential? And so when we say poor lands, <clears throat> we mean it's bad soil. And bad soil is not an issue if you're just putting a house, if you have piped water in, right? Then it's not so much of an issue. It doesn't matter that it's rocky, sandy no water. So you can bring in the water and you don't need good soil if you're just living there. So this is not so much of a problem. The big problem today is the second one, lack of funding. Here's how big the problem is. How many people are on the waiting list? 20,000. For each one of those, it would cost $60,000 to get them on the land. Now, can you build a house for 60000 So what is that money going to? Are they just plumbing? What else? Electricity. Infrastructure. The stuff you need before you can even have a house for you guys, Wi-Fi. Right? Necessities. Multiply that, do that math. It's 1.6 billion. <coughs> That's how short they are. That's why they lease a lot of their lands out, because the state doesn't give them any money. The guys don't give them any money. They're given land and no uh, funding stream to develop it. And 
even though the best period for Hawaiian homes was under Linda Lingle, there was still a downside, which is she believed that Hawaiian homes should be self-sufficient. They should generate their own money to build their own, uh, to develop their own lands. That means leasing out land. The more you lease out, though, the less land there is for Hawaiians to live on. So this is the big problem now. Actually, the state has uh, basically, over the last 20 years, given them the point six. That's $600 million. And we're almost at the end of that 20-year uh, period of, of transferring that over. This third one is not so much a problem anymore either. But in the old days, Hawaiian Homes was controlled by people who, this is an understatement, didn't have the best interests of Hawaiians in mind. There's a, a commissioner back in the 30s or 40s who, when Hawaiians would complain that they weren't getting their leases, he said, what do you Hawaiians want land for anyway? All you do is sit on your porches and play your ukuleles. That's a direct quote. That's the kind of person in charge of Hawaiian homes. That's the kind of society we were living in. That's not the case anymore, right? Nowadays, they actually put Hawaiians in charge of Hawaiian homes who actually want the program to succeed. I mean, what a concept. But this is, this is the territory for you. Non-Hawaiians in charge of Hawaiian homes, and what do they do? They sell it off, they give out leases to their friends. They don't care about Hawaiians getting on. Uh, give you an example, in the first 60 years of the program, only 3,800 Hawaiians got leases in 60 years. That's barely a dent in a waiting list. Right? This is the waiting list at one moment. At any given moment, there's 20,000 on the list. Over 60 years, less than 4,000 Hawaiians got leases. Okay, we talked about uh, and read about these uh, abuses. We talked about Lua Mule, which is basically destroyed. There's no way they can give it back because there's probably nuclear storage there, which will be there and contaminating that place for a few years, maybe you know, 200,000 years. That's how long the nuclear contamination lasts, 200,000 years. Um, <clears throat> schools and parks, we talked about a lot of these things. Illegal transfer of 30,000 acres, you have this. The, pro the problem was so big, you couldn't deny it. So there were settlements at the, at the federal level and then at the state level. At the federal level, that uh, 1,350 acres in Lualuale, which is Nanakuli Ma'ili, um, that was, they couldn't just give it back. That's where those radio antennas are. When you go past there and there's the, the supermarket, what is it, Big Way or something? And then you look in the back and there's those tall uh, radio antennas. That, that's that land. That's enough land to satisfy the whole Oahu waiting list. <clears throat> they can't give it back. So they swapped. They closed uh, the, the, air fort, no, the naval air base at uh, Barber's Point. <clears throat> And so they had this military land sitting there empty <clears throat> and Hawaiian homes that they were using. So they said, why don't you just take that land? And so there are Hawaiian homes now at what they call Barber's Point. Really Hawaii law. <clears throat> That's the very end of Ever Beach. Yeah, the, now that Hawaiian homes is there, they changed the name back to Kalai Loa. But there are a lot of places in Hawaii like this where a stupid ship captain crashed his ship somewhere and they renamed the place after that, after the captain. That's why, that's how we got the name Barber's Point. But the military base was called Barber's Point. Um, I'll talk about Barber's Point again a little later. So that's at the federal level, they did a swap. At the state level, they settled for $600 million. That's 0 .6, 0 0.6 billion. So out of the 1.6 that they needed, they got the 0.6 but spread out over 20 years. It started in 1995, so we're pretty much at the end of that 20 years. Who's white hey, hey.
John Whitehead? Yeah, you've seen him before. Came up here last year. Who is he? John Whitehead. Okay. I've told you there's only certain things you should know, but probably should know that John Waihe'e was the first Hawaiian governor of Hawaii. I don't know if you remember, but when they were here, the, uh, they kept referring to him as Governor Waihe'e. Right, Governor Waihe'e. And I, I was sitting there thinking, do these students even know, you know, that he really was the governor and when? Probably not. But he really was. He was governor from 1986 until 1994. No, I think that's right. I think that's right, because uh, Cayetano was elected in 94. Yeah. Okay. So, there's no debate about if the, the trust was being abused, Hawaiian Homes Trust. They already uh, admitted it and they've already settled. Okay, so when you look especially at this last point here, right here, this third point here, yeah, you put the program in, in uh, under the care of someone who really doesn't want it to succeed, doesn't care if Hawaiians get land. What can you say about this whole society in general? What does this allow for in the territory? Conflict between? Uh, well, between races, yeah. It allows for racism. If you want to think about the territory in a very simple way, <coughs> just think of it as a society based on race. Uh, you could look in the newspapers and you'd see job advertisements that would say, Hawaiians need not apply, or white only. In 1907, when the University of Hawaii was opened, uh, the first president, whose name was Crawford, uh, said, this university is for the white community of Hawaii. Um, now there's a Crawford Hall. Ironically, the Department of Ethnic Studies is in Crawford Hall. Um, if you end up at UH and takes uh, social science classes, any social sciences, so political science, economics, geography, anthro, sociology. You're going to be in a building called Saunders, and then that's where I teach my class, Saunders Hall. But that used to be called Porteus. Now they changed the name because graduate students found out and protested the fact that Porteus was a professor at UH who was studying eugenics. What is that? Okay, genocide is sometimes based on eugenics ideas. If eugenics is the idea, yeah, what idea? Yeah, yeah. Speaking of that, um, there was a History Day student, might have been from Kalaheo with um, Ms. Rizzi when she was there, but this History Day student went to nationals and actually found a letter that, that showed that Adolf Hitler was basing some of his ideas on American eugenics scholarship, scholarship if you want to call it that. So the professor studying race in a way that, oh, look at, the, uh, look at the skull size and look at the shape and this race is smarter than that race, that's why we are superior in all of this. And nobody had ever seen that letter before. In other words, groundbreaking original research by a History Day student, a high school student. Um, and she went, to, she went to nationals and got second at nationals and they actually asked her, like, how did you find this and nobody else has found it? Um, the answer is really that there's a lot of stuff out there like that, that people haven't, there's just not enough people uh, really looking and with the tools, with the skills to be able to interpret. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about racism now. And when you do that, you got to be very careful. And we talked about the, uh, the, the term of color, people of color. Uh, and not to you to say any Frank de Lima jokes when you go to the so-called mainland. But if we can talk about racism and race, you got to make sure you know what you're talking about. There are actually levels of racism. Yeah. Oh, what? Okay. Hawaiians were powerless. That's what that says. So even though Hawaiians are part of this sort of ruling coalition, the Hawaiian Republican Alliance, they're on the, they're the weak part of the alliance. Okay, so now we're going to talk about race. Uh, when you talk about race, uh, racism, discrimination, there's different levels. It's hard to think that there's mild racism, but I'll go through examples and you'll see that some levels of, or forms of racism are not as harmful directly as others. So the, the most mild, if you can use that term, mild form of racism is a, is a stereotype. And a stereotype is nothing but an idea about a group. That's it. It's only an idea. It's not an action. And it's about a group, it's not about an individual. So people walk around with stereotypes and it doesn't directly harm anybody. Not, not yet, not just being there as a stereotype. So what's a stereotype about Hawaiians? Lazy, let's go with that one. Hawaiian equals lazy. That is a stereotype. Where does it come from? comes from the fact that New England missionaries came here with the Protestant work ethic. And they said, you need to work 12 hours a day wearing long sleeves and coats and top hats and, you know, basically killing yourself. Some of them were practically dropping dead from trying to work like they did in the freezing cold here in the blazing hot. And when Hawaiians didn't do that, because Hawaiians were sane and they worked four hours a day, uh, they, just, they said they were lazy. So that's a stereotype that has a, a history. Okay, so nobody's directly harmed though. It's just an idea about a group. Prejudice is the next level where you apply that stereotype to an individual. So you do a little calculation in your head. I'm gonna pick on Eva. Eva equals Hawaiian. Therefore, Eva is lazy. Because Hawaiians are lazy. If Hawaiians are lazy and Eva is Hawaiian, therefore, Eva is lazy. Okay? So now it's an individual. Not just a group, but an individual, and I'm thinking something about him, but I haven't harmed him yet. I don't harm him until something, uh, a situation happens, like he applies for a job with me. Okay, so there's a job, he applies, I'm the one hiring, and here's the thing, he's the best, he's the most qualified person. Really, no doubt about it. Okay. He applies to me. Uh, I, I look at his resume. I look at the qualifications that the job requires, and the match is perfect. Nobody else is perfect like that. So, looks like I should hire him. But I know, or I think I know, that Hawaiians are lazy. And now I know for sure he's Hawaiian because there's a check box on the application that says optional. Tell us what your race is. It's optional. But he thought that might help him. So he checked Native Hawaiian. So now I know for sure he's Hawaiian. And I think I know for sure that Hawaiians are lazy. And I don't want a lazy person doing the job so I don't hire him. Now I've just done <coughs> racist behavior. Which is to act on my prejudice.
Okay? So my action is <coughs> no job for me yet. It's pretty bad, isn't it? I just didn't hire the best qualified person. Well, that's a big thing, right? In, uh, in since Ferguson and now with the, the guy in New York, right? So this is a this is a serious issue. It's not only that. There are there are um, there are communities, usually in the suburbs of major cities, that are trying to break away and make their own cities. And the reason is they don't like, uh, because back in the 60s they had busing, so they would bus kids from poor communities into more affluent suburbs, and they would have a more diverse school. And what that did was it brings the scores down, and, and there's more fights and things like that, there's more ethnic conflict. And so these town, these uh, suburbs want to break away and form their own cities so that they can have their own school districts. And people are saying, you're, you're going against decades and decades of civil rights progress. There's a point of why we had busing in the first place. It's to prevent these sort of uh, white enclave schools where you get a good education and then inner city schools, you know, minorities getting a bad education. I mean, it's... In, in Massachusetts, in, in the inner city, in Boston, the schools, they're spending about $4,000 per student. In affluent suburbs like Concord, you know Thoreau had this little cabin on Walden Pond, so well, that's in the town of Concord. The school in Concord, uh, they spend $22,000. That's more than they're spending on you guys at a private school. So I had a friend at Harvard who was uh, a graduate of there, and he's like, I'm a public school graduate. I'm like, he went to Concord. That's, that's more than the school that George Bush went to, the private school. At the time, that school was only 18000 and they were spending twenty two for a public school. And so that's what they do. They sort of hoard their money and keep it to themselves. Um, so, so this idea of race, race discrimination is a... It's starting to actually pick back up again. Um, this is pretty bad. Even it doesn't get the job. Um, luckily, people know that there are racists out there, and so they have some safeguards. So let's say the job was at University of Hawaii. Ava could go to a court and bring his resume and bring the job description. And he would also know who actually got the job <clears throat> and look at their resume and say, look, mine is a perfect match. You hired somebody unqualified who's not as qualified as me. So that the only reason that I wasn't hired was race. And that's illegal. Because uh, maybe if you apply for a job, you see at the bottom it says, we are an equal opportunity affirmative action that's what that means. That means they try to go for diversity and they um, <clears throat> give everybody an equal shot, regardless of race, religion, and in Hawaii, gender. Right? Now, Ava can take it to court and he can win and he can get the job or compensation, money for pain and suffering, or both. He has to decide, does he actually want to work with me after I tried to not give him the job? That's his decision. But what's the key to that? What's the key to him winning this lawsuit? Okay, and how does he do that? What's the key factor there? Huh? Okay, what, what's the evidence showing? That he's showing me. The fact that he was actually the best. So what's the moral of the story? Be the best. Because if you're not the best, if you're like the second or third best, then there's, they can find a reason and say, 
oh, there's this one little qualification that he didn't have, and that's why I didn't hire him. It's not the race. It's that one little thing. Even if it's not true, if that if that's there, uh, they can they can they have an excuse not to hire you, and then you lose. So be the best. It's kind of like getting A's in school. Probably you guys have figured this out by now. It took me a while when I figured out the way to get A's is to not give the teacher any excuse to give you anything other than an A, right? Cover all your bases. And that's what you have to do in a job search, especially since you guys are minorities and you have to compete against a system like this. You know, what could be worse than not getting a job that you're most qualified for? Is there anything worse than that? The system, when the system is actually set up that way, where it's actually built in. <clears throat> so not only no job for Ava, no job for Hawaiian. Surely this such a thing doesn't exist in 2014. Does it exist? No. <clears throat> What's an example? Can anybody give an example of institutional racism? <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Definitely. But um, it's an example of institutional racism. You said it exists, so. Where we can help them. What about it? Um, during the. Like, during the last century, there, it was nicknamed Bobbyham because of the number of buses that held black people. Or like houses of people of color that had. Or people of color that had been like hazed and harassed simply because of their skin color. Okay. And it still continues in the South today. According to my brother from Texas. My brother from Texas. <clears throat> oh, Michael Brown's church was uh, set on fire just a couple of days ago. But, but that's actually not nearly as common as it was back then. Uh, what about what goes on today? talking about the 60s, but what about today? Is there institutional racism? Yes or no? There has to be, but it's kind of hard to point to it, right? It's hard to actually find it. So, so for example, um, if you look at African Americans and Latinos in the United States, they are about 25% of the population. 12% African American, 13 or 14% black. It's about a quarter. But the prison population is 83%. You don't care about that. Well, it's the same thing here. Hawaiians are 19% of the population and 50% of the prison population. Okay, maybe you don't care about that either because you know you have cousins who, they're just bad, right? They do bad stuff and they get arrested and they deserve it. They deserve to be in Ko'olau Mountain. Right? <laughs> Ko'olau Boys Home. The Hawaiians, you know, yeah, they're in prison, but it's because they do more crime. They get arrested. Actually, Hawaiians are the most incarcerated, but they're not the most arrested. They're not the most arrested. So something happens from the time of arrest. If you're Hawaiian and you get arrested, you're much more likely to end up incarcerated at the end of that process. But what's happening at all those little steps along the way? We don't know for sure. There's no real data. That's why it's hard to come up with examples of institutional racism. Although I have a friend who's a court translator, he translates Japanese, uh, so he's in the courts all the time, and he said, basically, if you're Hawaiian, you're guilty. 
Not if you are Hawaiian, if you appear to be Hawaiian. Right. Okay, so that's that's uh, anecdotal. Um, but it's hard to it's hard to point to it. Except for what? Our school. In our school it's not hard to point to it. You just have to get an application and it says right in there, we discriminate against non-Hawaiians. So the ironic thing about institutional racism is that the biggest target of it is our school right here. Yeah. So, are we institutional racists? Yes. <laughs> Anybody say no? Should we have this admissions policy? I can tell you right now, 95% of Americans would say no. Why? Because, uh, have you heard of affirmative action? Yes. Well, that's good, because most of my students haven't. So you know that, oh, somebody said, uh, schools want minorities, right? So that, that will benefit you when you apply to college, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in it or not, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you. When you apply, be sure to check Native Hawaiian on the application, if they have it. Because they want to show their school yeah. Diversity is a strength. And especially in places where it's hard to get diversity, like Vermont, right? The whitest state in America. <laughs> so far. Okay, so, so should we have our admissions policy, or is it just straight up racist? Okay, we have the will defense. Do you know that every will is interpreted by a judge? It's called probate. So the will is nothing. It's nothing. Like you could make a will and you say, I have seven kids, but I only like number three. Everything for number three, screw all the rest. And then you die and you say, oh, I made my will. Well, the other kids say, look, this isn't fair. And the judge says, you're right, it's not fair. Change it. Everybody gets one seven. They can do that. That's called probate. They always do that. I was seven kids, but I liked the third one. So everything for the third one. You can try to do that, but you might not get away with it because the, the judge can always interpret your will. So the will is nothing. Okay, what is your justification that Hawaiians need the most help? Because it's a prison rate. Oh, but that's a separate issue. Okay, so what do you have to know? to believe that this is not institutional racism here. I mean, the history of... It's like giving Jews... History is what you need to know. No, they've already ruled on that. Um, you said it's like affirmative action. Okay, affirmative action says... Um, if the community is 19% Hawaiian, our school should be 19% Hawaiian. It should reflect the community. So is this affirmative action? No. No, we're saying the community is 19%, we should be 100%. It's beyond affirmative action, way beyond. That's why 73% of Americans are against affirmative action. They don't even believe the, the school should reflect the society. If you were to say it should go beyond affirmative action, you're going to have 95%. I, I'm, as soon as uh, Bill O'Reilly gets a hold of our school, it's over. It's over for us. Our, it's our admissions policy, Bill O'Reilly, he's the most famous right-wing talk show host in America. Right-wing, conservative, he's a, he's a nut job. Oh, did I say that on camera? No, everybody, everybody knows that. Um, 
Yeah, and but they've already ruled on that. They they tried to argue. Look, it's just preference. It's not a, it's not uh, excluding other races. And uh, the Ninth Circuit Court <coughs> said it's a virtual bar. Virtually, it keeps everybody else out because there's enough Hawaiian applicants that you'll never go to a non-Hawaiian, except on Maui, where everybody's crazy. Did I say that on camera? Yes. <laughs> On Maui, they don't have enough applicants. Not because there's not enough Hawaiians. They have homesteads there. But they don't apply. Why? Sports. They want their kids to go to Baldwin or, God forbid, Lahaina Luna to play football. They all think that their kids are going to end up in the NFL. So they don't apply to Kamehameha. They take, they've taken already two non-Hawaiians with the preference policy in place. These are not lawsuits. They're just apply, get in. Because it's a preference. If you run out of Hawaiians, you go to non-Hawaiians. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. That'll never happen here because there's ten times as many applicants as slots. Yeah, right? Okay, so we talked about some examples of institutional racism. Any other examples you can think of? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, could be, could be. Um, well, I have an example right here. The Massey case. Uh, we call it the Massey case. It's actually two cases. It's two trials. Um, so sometimes it's called the Massey affair. But it involved a group of local, young local men. In fact, the term local itself comes from this case. Before this case, there's no locals. Uh, and so the, one of the men was Joseph Gaha Hawaii, who was central to the case. And then the Masseys are, that's, but that was a separate case. So the, 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 the case started 1931. Um, there was a military couple. Lieutenant Thomas Massey and his wife, Thalia Massey. Um, she was 20 years old and she's quite rambunctious. She would get in fights. Uh, there were rumors she was having an affair or more than one affair. And she would do things like yell at her husband and storm out into the night. And she did that one night in Waikiki. Do you guys know where Wailana Coffee House is? So that road that goes, that narrow road that goes down, John, John Anna Road, that's, that's where she, that's where it happened. She stormed out of this place called the Alawai Inn, and, and then something happened to her. She was assaulted. And we don't know exactly what happened to her, but when she was picked up, she claimed that she had been uh, attacked and raped by five big Hawaiians, she said. And they said, can you identify them? She said, no, no I couldn't see anything. But when five locals were brought in a few hours later, all of a sudden her memory started to improve and she said, that was them, these five here. It was actually two Japanese, one Hawaiian Chinese, and two Hawaiians, Benny Ahakuelo and Joseph Bahahawai. Um, so there's a lawsuit, so a lawsuit started against them, and there was a trial uh, against them for the rape of Thalia Massey. The problem was there's no evidence placing them on the scene of the crime whatsoever. Uh, and, but actually the judge, the, the jury was a hung jury, so they didn't agree, they didn't have a unanimous decision, so mistrial. Uh, during all this time, there's this media frenzy going on here and on the continent that Honolulu is not a safe place for white womanhood, that women are threatened by these kind of brutes and and there's all this pressure coming down, and they're saying, well, if the courts can't take care of it, 
you guys better just do it yourself. And there's all this pressure on her husband to kind of man up and take vigilante justice. Her, her mother flew in, Thalia, sorry, Grace Fortescue. She was actually the niece of Alexander Graham Bell. So she was kind of a high society person and she's trying to protect her good name. And she, along with two of his military buddies from the Navy, they kidnapped Joseph Gahahabai, who they identified as the darkest of the five. And they interrogated him and shot him to death in a house in Manoa. The house is still there, it's by Noah Lani School. So then there's an, another trial against the Masseys for the murder of Joseph Kahahabai because they were caught red-handed with the body. They drove down Waialai and the police chased them and they, tried, they were trying to dump the body by the blowhole by Hanalma Bay. So the trial is now against the Masseys. It's the second trial and um, they, couldn't, they couldn't, they really had no defense. They actually hired the most famous lawyer in America, Clarence Darrow. Remember the Scopes Monkey Trial? That's the guy. He's the first celebrity lawyer in America. And even he couldn't find a real defense. So his defense was uh, the husband, Thomas, had blacked out in, in, in a rage and shot Dahabai with, uh, with a sort of insanity. He was temporarily insane. And, but his real defense was, okay, what he did was against the law, but there's a higher law above the law that says you defend your wife. That this is what they would call an honor killing. Uh, the judge, the jury, was under a lot of pressure to find them not guilty, uh, but they, they didn't buckle under the pressure. They found them guilty, and they were sentenced to 10 years in prison. Now there's so much pressure now, even the President of the United States came into the scene. He, he called the Governor of Hawaii, Lawrence Judd, descendant of the missionary Jared Judd, and he said, if you send these people to jail, I'm going to take away your civilian government and institute martial law, because Hawaii is not governable by civilians. And so Lawrence Judd, as territorial governor, remember, how does he become governor? Appointed by, by the president. The guy who appointed him is calling him and saying, uh, don't let them be found guilty, don't let them go to jail. He had the power to reduce the sentence. He reduced the sentence from 10 years, down, 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 to one hour. Not an hour in prison even, an hour in his office, in the governor's office. Urban myth says, drinking iced tea. A week later, they're on a ship out of Hawaii. Now, the next year, uh, they hired a bunch of Pinkertons that was private detectives. Have you heard of Pinkertons from U.S. history? They hired Pinkertons to reinvestigate this whole case, and they went over all of the uh, all of the facts, and they found two things. One, there was no possibility whatsoever that these five had assaulted her because they were in Kalihi. They're from right down here. Joseph Bahavai is buried at the bottom of the hill by the bus terminal, and his gravestone says. Born Christmas Day, killed. It says killed, not died. <coughs> and they were over here in Kalihi at the time that it happened, so there's no possibility they could have done it. Secondly, and this is the big bombshell, Thalia Massey was legally blind. And she had withheld this during all of the trial. She was legally blind. She had a bit of vision, but there's no way she would have identified any attackers, no matter who they were. So her identification of them was bogus. Now, so the nasty case is happening? Yeah. The question is, yeah, the question is why, yeah, why didn't the whole jury, there were probably some jury members who just wanted them to be guilty Automatically. That's what honor killing means. It means you kill somebody to preserve your honor. It doesn't matter if that's the right person. Yeah, there have been cases on the mainland that, uh, um, around this time that that was happening. So what this did was it, there's a white community reaction and they're putting pressure on these guys. There's also the local reaction. And in fact, this creates locals. Before this case, these would be just five 
men of different races, Japanese, Hapapake, and Hawaiian. But after the race, what it sort of did was, it's like the locals said, okay, if you're going to lump us all together, then we're going to be all together against you. And so that creates local. You say, I'm local. Well, that's, that whole term is a result of a murder. Because after this murder, local people sort of said, okay, you want to lump us together? We're going to be together against you. So that's why it sounds funny when someone says, well, I'm a Haole, but I'm a local Haole. Because local means not Haole. So there's no such thing as a local Haole. Even if you've been here five generations, you were on the side of the Masses five genera uh, four generations ago. Right? <laughs> then? <laughs> Not by the law. Um, <coughs> Thalia Massey actually died of an overdose in the 60s, barbiturates. Uh, his military career kind of stalled and he was discharged. But Grace Fortescue lived until her 90s, water skiing in Florida. She wrote her account of this whole trial and made a ton of money. So she's the one who really literally got away with murder. Um, so there's this case and it's inflaming the local people, basically showing locals that in Hawaii, if you're white and you murder, you get away with murder. On the other hand, there was another trial called the Fukunaga trial. Miles Fukunaga was a Japanese guy who was, I guess, super frustrated and he kidnapped the son of a big five executive, Puno student, and ended up shooting the kid. And in that case, it's like the trial and the conviction and the execution happened so quickly, it's like the wheels of justice moved a little bit too quickly. So it's like if you're white and you kill somebody, you get away with it. If you're local and you kill somebody, you're automatically executed. So between these two cases, Hawaiians are seeing the institutional racism. You always know it's there, but in this case, it's coming to the surface. Does that make sense? So you might think that you still live in a racist society, but it's not like that, right? I'll give you another example. Remember we, oh, you guys, we, we only watched some clips with that movie Hawaii. A terrible movie. Uh, the guy who wrote the book, James Michener, one of the most famous writers of all time. After he wrote the book, he liked Hawaii so much he wanted to live here. So he wanted to buy a house in Kahala. So he went to the landowner, which was Bishop of State at the time, and he said, I'd like to buy this, uh, this parcel. And they said, okay, fine. Uh, just come back tomorrow with a picture of you and your wife. So he came back the next day and showed him the picture, and his wife happened to be Japanese. So they said, Oh, I'm sorry, no sale. That's Kahala we're talking about. The Bishop Estate was part of this system of certain places are only for whites. Which, you could never get away with that today, but that's how it was. And the, the way of thinking about it was, that's the way it is, just accept it. Mr. Lapsley, the counselor, has a degree in Hawaiian history and talks about this stuff all the time. He kind of remembers the territory, the uh, late territory, early statement. And he says, that's, that's the way everybody thought. That's the way it is. Just accept it. The ironic thing is, now we at Kamehameha are the ones saying, this is the way it is. This school is for Hawaiians. That's the way it is. Just accept it. And it's everybody else who's saying, no, we don't accept that. And that's why they're suing us, right? So it's this ironic twist. In fact, we're the ones living in the territory. Remember, it's kind of like a little bubble where it's still the territory in here. But there was one little positive part about the territory, and that is everybody accepted. Onoho's for missionaries, Iolani's for, you know, engineers, and Kamehameha's <laughs> for Hawaiians. Not Hawaiians... Not any Hawaiians, but the ones who can speak proper English, not pidgin, and are good at, uh, they can become firemen and climb telephone poles. That, that's how it was. <laughs> Just accept it. That's what good and industrious meant. When I post this on, uh, on the internet, it's going to be only those with the link. <laughs> because this is the kind of stuff people usually you don't talk about in public. Right? You talk about it at your kitchen table with your family. Oh, 
these Hawaiians are like this, or other people are like that. But these are all real things. Um, and there's a book now called Ethnicity and Inequality in Hawaii. It's written by a Japanese professor of ethnic studies at UH. And he just puts it on the table. He says, in Hawaii, we have an upper class and an underclass. And what determines your class is race. And he says, the upper class is Haole, Japanese, and Chinese, and the underclass is Hawaiian, Filipino, and Samoan. And that's how it is here today. So it's not me saying that and speculating. It's actually he backs it up with data. So it's not as bad, though, as it used to be. How did it all change? Um, you know, the, the, the plantations like to divide and conquer. They would separate people and you live in a camp with only people of your own race, Japanese camp, Filipino camp. And so you'd be very mistrustful and they'd pay them different amounts, right? So if you're Japanese, you'd make $11 a month. If you're Filipino, you'd make $8 a month. And they, what would happen then? They don't like each other, they fight. They'd fight over the $3 a month. And that's good because it, from the, from the owner's perspective, it's good because it diverts their attention from the big picture, which is the guy at the top is becoming the wealthiest person, not in Hawaii, in America. These are some of the wealthiest families in America because they can make 100% every year. But slowly, uh, people started to share experiences across race. When I was in at Lahaina Luna, those old timers in Lahaina, they would say, like, I'll remember the plantation, remember how hard it was, or how hard the work was. It was incredibly, incredibly hard. Just that experience of being on the plantation was the same whether you were one race or another race. It doesn't matter. And so they would share that. And they start going on strike together. So we're going to go over each one of these. <clears throat> World War II puts things in perspective. You start to think, well, who's really the enemy? Is it that guy of another race down the road? Or is it maybe, I don't know, Adolf Hitler? Who's the real enemy here? Everybody had to fight together. And then changes in demographics. Now, demographics means things like where you live, what you do for a living, how much money you make, your social class, all of those things. Uh, the statistics of it is the demographics. Okay. I won't do this as an icebreaker, but has anyone... Uh, have heard experiences from the, the territorial period. I know it's been a long time now, about 55 years since statehood. That, that long ago. Anything? Plantation life? Yeah. Curfew. That's a that's a thing that's kind of forgotten about Hawaiian history. There was about four years where uh, you had to black your window, you had to put black paper on your windows. If you had a little crack in it, there were people patrolling and they would knock on your door and they say, "There's a little crack and light shining out. You got to patch it up because they don't want the town to be visible from the air in case there was another airstrike, an airstrike by Japanese." Oh, my grandma, my grandma's family was my grandma's family, they're Japanese too, but they, or at least, they're from 
because most most Japanese didn't get interned here. It was the ones who were seen with the closest ties to Japan. Because Japanese at the time were 45% of the population. 45%. So there's no way you could do internment care. You, you wouldn't have an economy without Japanese. Oh, yeah. yeah. So they had internment camps on every major island. So the one here was in Formula Ever plane. Um, there are uh, programs where you can go and look at the site. And every major island has one. Any others? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's sort of a carryover from World War One when they would have you know, mustard gas and stuff like that, tear gas. You have gas masks and you have drills. Kind of like lockdown right now, ready for the worst. this picture here that sums up the whole territory because what they did was they put everybody in their racial categories and they told you you are Portuguese Japanese Hawaiian Haole Korean Chinese and you kind of smoosh them all together and not too happy about it that's the territory and also they teach them that when they're very young. So you have this idea locked in your mind, where are you in the social order? And even the fact that the Portuguese girl is looking over at the Haole, she's kind of going, wait a minute, am I with you or am I with them? That's a serious question. And the answer was, you're with them, you're not with us. And that's how Portuguese became local. Some people say, oh, are you Haole? No, I'm Portuguese, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Haole. Well, last time I checked, let me double check. I think Portugal is uh, in Europe. <coughs> yeah, there it is. It's in Europe. In fact, they were one of the worst colonizers in all of history. So, how did Portuguese become not Haole? How did that happen? They were excluded. These guys said, yeah, you're, you're European, but you're not like us. You're the high Europeans. You're the lower Europeans. And so what happened was, eventually they lost power and the locals gained power, and so the Portuguese said, oh, we're with them. Plus they can speak pigeon, so no problem fitting in. These guys can't speak pigeon. Portuguese speak pigeon because they're the lunas. They're the field managers on the plantation, the ones who ride the horses and yell at all the rest of them. So they're the intermediary between the, the owners and the workers. And so in the end, they joined the workers and became local. Not Holly. Okay. Everybody stand up. <coughs> 